Welcome to Diversify Your Bookshelf. We're so glad you're here tonight with us. Thank you. So we have three presenters here tonight. We have Amy Waters, Katie Almendinger, that's me, and Tom Malinowski. So a bit of housekeeping before we move into what we're all here for, which is the book talking. If you want some CPDU uh, credit, one CPDU credit, please make sure that your Zoom name matches your first and last name that you signed up with. So I know that you are actually here so I can award credits to you. And then you also have to stay for the duration of the program. So we know that you are here. And at the end of that program, we will, or this program, we will send you a um, survey in order for you to receive that CPU credit. So it's really important that you stay the whole time and that your name matches the name that you signed up with if you need a CPDU credit. If you don't need a CPDU credit and you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. And then um, we have structured this presentation so there's time for part questions and participation and conversation at the end of this program, but the chat box is there. Feel free to use it. We'll pay attention to it and you can also send us questions as panelists too. And then the last thing here before we get started is information about the Glen Ellen DEI project coming up on Saturday, which is the 23rd at 10 a.m. We have a panel of village leaders talking about things that their organizations have done and are planning to do on topics about uh, related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then at 1 p.m. on Saturday, we have a panel of community organizations like um, the Glumbard Early Childhood collaboration talking about what they have done um, as organizations that serve the community about DEI. And then we also have affinity groups. I believe that is next Thursday, the 28th. Yep. And these are groups for people to have conversations about their place in Glen Ellen and um, as they identify. Um, and we're especially looking for people who are age 17 and under women and those who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community to participate in those conversations. And those conversations are gonna help guide um, Glen Ellen towards a more equitable future. And then on January 30th at 9 a.m., we have a community listening session to hear about some of those plans and to get excited about some of those new things that we're going to be doing um, as a more equitable and inclusive Glen Ellen. So if you have any questions about those programs, definitely take a look at our library calendar um, or send us an email and we'll be happy to point you in the right direction. All right, so we also have a couple of goals for us here today. Um, we are trying to increase your awareness of diverse materials, especially diverse materials that you can use as mentor texts in conversations with young children. And we are also trying to give you um, inspiration on how you might use these materials with children. And we're also just really trying to increase your awareness that there are some really great diverse books out there. Speaking of diverse books, there's Your Name is a Song, which is by Jamila Tompkins Bigelow and Luisa Uribe. And we are framing our book talks in a very specific way tonight. We are, a, we've written a brief synopsis and then we've picked out three overarching words to um, relate to the title's theme. And we'll ask a concluding question to help frame your thinking about how you might use these titles. And so we'll get started with Your Name is a Song. And names are songs and they're intentional gifts from parents. And this is all about making sure that you pronounce children's names right. And as somebody whose name, first name and last name um, can be challenging. I've had plenty of teachers and adults in my life who didn't take the time to learn how to pronounce my name. Um, and so this book not only resonates with me, it also resonates and hits home for children who have names that aren't as commonplace in our culture. 
And for this book, um, it, the main question here is, what can you do that's focused on respecting names and their cultural origin, especially um, on the first day of school or when your children meet new friends? What can you do to help children learn names? Okay, this is Catherine's War by Julia Bullitt. Graphic novel, fifth through eighth grade with topics World War II, culture and identity. During World War II, Rachel Cohen attends a school for youngsters when told she must change her name to Catherine Cohen to appear not Jewish or possibly be deported. Based on the author's mother's own experiences as a hidden child in France during World War II, Catherine's War is one of the most accessible historical graphic novels featuring a powerful young woman. One's own identity is truly sacred and shouldn't be tampered with. And a question to ponder here is, should you give up your identity if your life is at stake? All right, so uh, this story is Mindy Kim and the Yummy Seaweed Business. It's part of a new series for first through third graders. And this installment deals with grief, moving and fitting in. After the illness and death of her mother, Min Young, Mindy Kim and her father have moved cross country from California to Florida. In California, there were many Korean students like her. But now in Florida, a dog obsessed girl with a spunky personality, Mindy is wondering if she can find a friend in a school where nobody looks like her, has a name like hers and whose lunch is just one more way she stands out in the crowd. What are some ways, as a question to ponder, that food can be used both to connect and then how is it sometimes used to ostracize or other people? Hot Pot by Vincent Chen. Hot Pot, Hot Pot hits the right spot. Hot Pot is a Chinese East Asian soup stock tradition that dates back to the Mongolian Empire. And in Hot Pot, very much like stone soup, this story proves that food is better when cooked together and shared with your neighbors. And my question for you about this book is, how can you use food to bring people together? How can you interrupt the lack of representation in stories about food? All right. Ways to Make Sunshine by Renee Watson is the first in a new planned series that really works for first through fifth grade. It's described as being Ramona-like and many of the um, conversations revolve around the family's economic changes. The illustrator for this is Nina Mata. Ryan is that most real of children, a complex girl who will race the boys to the pole on the playground, prank her brother with hot sauce, freezes up during public speaking, worries about sleepovers, and has a head full of ideas. Um, she'll find a way to help her friends bring sunshine, even on a bad rainy day. It's a story that's filled with black girl magic and Ryan, this character really shines. So I look forward to seeing more of her. Um, and one of the questions we want you to ponder is what does it mean to kind of shake up the literary canon that you deal with in curriculums right now? So when this says this is Ramona-like, um, do we have other Ramona-like char characters who are kids of color? And so that's something we'd like to think about. This is Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park. This is a fourth to sixth grade fiction novel. And Prairie Lotus is about a girl, Hannah, who is determined to fit in and realize her dreams. And her dreams are getting an education, becoming a dressmaker in her father's shop, and making at least one friend. And a lot of us grew up with loving books like Little House on the Prairie, but now books that we loved as children might be problematic as we're more aware of the lack of representation in canon and as we um, you know, approach them with an adult lens in our adult lives. And how can we share books like Little House on the Prairie with children in a way that interrupts that canon and in a way that um, gives a true 
um, or more accurate representation to children as they're absorbing these titles that we loved as children. This is Guts by Raina Telgemeier, fiction graphic novel, fourth through eighth grade. Topics of stress, school, and advice. Raina gets nervous around people eating certain foods and has an aversion for vomiting, which leads to a cycle of nervousness and unhealthy choices. Before long, she develops a phobia about food and throwing up to the point where she's missing school and literally making herself sick. Here are two pages. Uh, fortunately, her parents get her to an understanding therapist who helps Raina start to get a handle on the actual things in her life that are causing her stress and anxiety. And you can see uh, just on the left page, you can see Raina is hesitant in telling why she's late going to a therapist. And so my question is, what are ways to promote the positive benefits of therapy? Lila and Hadley by Cody Keplinger is fiction for fourth to seventh grade and deals with anger, uh, impending blindness, and navigating obstacles. Hadley must move to a new state to live with her estranged dog trainer sister after her mother is sent to prison. During a stop at the animal shelter run by her sister's girlfriend, Hadley meets the saddest dog, Lila. Recognizing something in each other, this not-a-dog person, Hadley, with Lila at her side, begins to cope with the changes in her living situation, separation from her friends, her anger at her mom, and her loss of eyesight. She manages to turn her focus to mastering new abilities. And the question we have for you is, do we recognize the obstacles, both seen and unseen, that some of the kids in our lives may be digging? dealing with and navigating? This is a picture book called I Talk Like a River. And in this moving book, this is a story about a boy and how he finds confidence in his voice despite the fact that he has a stutter. And this book also has a really healthy father-son relationship, which believe it or not is rare. These days in our children's literature, there's a lot of really great girl dad uh, books and a lot of really great mom books, but not so much those father son books. And so this representation is really great in this title. And my question for you is, how are father son books and father son relationships represented in your bookshelves and in your book collections? This is The Running Dream by uh, Wendelin Van Drainen, fiction, sixth through 12th graders, dealing with loss, perseverance, and homework. Jessica thinks her life is over when she loses a leg in a car accident, and the idea of a prosthetic leg doesn't encourage her with hope. She has to learn to believe in her, in her own capabilities and to accept those from around her so that she can once again cross a finish line. This was such an inspiring story about the power of positivity and friendship. I love the strong message of disability awareness. And that leads me to my question to consider, what is the polite way to engage in disability awareness with someone who has a disability? And up next, this is Obsessed, an autobiography by Allison Britz. And this is uh, for eighth grade to adult, dealing with OCD, family, and healing. Sophomore Allison Britz has a nightmare about getting cancer, which sets her on the path of, of obsessive thoughts that are detrimental to her life. Probably the most poignant book I've read about OCD as the author is writing from her point of view. I have a better grasp at how it can start and just spread drastically to affect someone's life and the lives around them. We shouldn't use the phrase, oh, you're, so, you, oh, you're just OCD or anything similar at all. Mental illness is not an adjective. A question for discussion, how do you approach someone with a mental illness that is affecting their life detrimentally? And maintaining a little bit along that theme, we have Before the Ever After by Jacqueline Woodson, one of my favorite authors. This one is geared for fourth to eighth grade. A third grader could also, a good strong third grader could read this. Uh, football, loss, and community are some of the topics. 
Former pro football player Zachariah Johnson is everyone's hero, according to his son, ZJ. But as Zachariah Sr. starts to forget things and behave in strange and sometimes frightening ways, ZJ tries to find ways to connect with his dad, including through their shared love of music. It will take ZJ's community of friends and family to help all of the Johnsons navigate through the sad changes ahead as football injuries take their toll and a loving family deals with the anger, sadness, and sense of loss. Uh, this is a novel in verse. Uh, and one of the questions to consider is when mental health issues affect families, do we provide space for those discussions or do we pull away? Speaking about family, this is Ohana Means Family. And this is by Iliama Lewis, Loomis and Kennard Pack. And join the family or Ohana as they farm taro or poi to prepare for a traditional luau celebration with a poetic text in the style of this is the house that Jack built. Um, this is a great book for picture, uh, a great picture book for preschoolers, especially on the topic of Hawaii. I know a lot of preschool classrooms do units on Hawaii and Hawaii doesn't have all that great material out there on it. So this is definitely one to get your hands on if you study Hawaii. And my question for you here is, as we think about this book, how is your representation of the landscape within the United States? The East Coast is different from the West Coast and same with the Midwest and each area has their own strengths and their own unique things about them. How is that represented in your classroom and on your bookshelves? Are your books all about cities or do you have some more unique places in there as well? This is The Line Tender by Kate Allen Fiction, uh, recommended for sixth through 10th graders and dealing with grief, family and healing. A tragedy that further alters the course of Lucy's life as she decides to continue the shark research her marine biologist mother left unfinished when she died years earlier. Acceptance and healing in terms of grief takes many forms. One is neglect. This book deals with the power of pushing grief to the side and the results that can come from that. A question to consider, how does a family deal with multiple losses over the span of a few years? We Are Water Protectors by Carol Lindstrom and Michaela Good. This is one of the most beautiful books to come out this year. And this is inspired by the many indigenous led movements across North America. And it issues an urgent rallying cry to safeguard the earth's water from harm and corruption. This is a great book to work into your earth care units and your books about how we preserve the land that we live on. And my question for you is, do you only discuss indigenous people around Thanksgiving? Notice the we are in language used in the title. Do you talk about indigenous people in the present tense or only in the past tense because they're still here? Oh, this is me again. My Hair is Beautiful by Chante Grant. This is a board book. This is a celebration of natural hair featuring photos of real bold, beautiful babies against a white background, much like the cover of this book, which makes it great for sharing with babies. It's really eye-catching for them. And my question here is, how do we teach children to respectfully observe the natural differences among each other? Okay. Uh, Black Brother, Black Brother by Jewel Parker Rhodes is fiction for fourth through eighth grade. And this deals with colorism and racism, bullying and fencing. Two brothers, Black mother, Black father, uh, same parents. But when Dante, the younger and much darker skinned brother, joins his older brother at the fancy prep school he attends, he is taunted as the Black Brother by the white school bully. Blamed for something he didn't do, Dante's trip to the office exposes the administration's racism when police are called on him and Dante ends up arrested. Dante takes the fight to the fencing mat to show what he's made of 
and to expose Alan for the bully he is. And my question for you would be, who do we listen to and let tell their story? And who do we ignore or silence because we have already made assumptions based on our own biases? This is a picture book called I Am Every Good Thing by Derek Barnes and Gordon C. James. And if you're familiar with Crown, an ode to the fresh cut. This is written by the same um, author-illustrator duo. And I have a snippet of the story for you on the next page. And these are the words that go along with this very striking image. And I want you to just look at this image while I read the text to you. I am brave. I am hope. I am my ancestor's wildest dream. I am worthy of success, of respect, of safety, of kindness, of happiness. Isn't that what we want for all of our children? Um, and this book is the epitome of hashtag black boy joy. And if you aren't familiar with hashtag black boy joy or hashtag black girl magic, definitely take a moment to look those up because they're really um, affirming for our children, our black children. And then my question for you is, are your books about boys, notice I didn't say boy books, books about boys, are they as self-affirming as your books about girls? Sharon Draper brings us blended fiction, fifth through eighth grade, dealing with blended family, racism, and identity. With a black father and white mother who are divorced, Izzy navigates between two very different worlds and cultures and tries to make sense of how the two can live in harmony. One week, she's Isabella with her dad, his girlfriend Anastasia, and her son Darren living in a fancy house where they are one of the only black families in the neighborhood. The next week, she's Izzy with her mom and her boyfriend, John Mark, in a small, not so fancy house that she loves. Izzy switches houses, backpacks, nicknames, but should she switch identities as well? And which leads me to my question, if a child belongs to more than one household, what are some ways to keep identity intact? Okay, Measuring Up. This book by Lily Lamont and illustrated by Anne Shu is a graphic novel for about fourth through sixth grade, dealing with new immigrants, friendship, and cooking. Cece has just moved to America with her family and she is trying to fit in, but she gets confused by things like sleepovers and fireplaces and her lunch gets ridiculed at school. But along with her new friends, they learn the many similarities there are between Cece's family's Taiwanese traditions and some of the ones she's learning about in America. A cooking contest and some advice from Julia Child will help Cece as she honors her family at the same time she embraces her new American life. This uh, graphic novel is steeped in Taiwanese food and culture. Um, and it's also a, fr a friendship story a family story, a cooking story, as well as an immigrant story. And my question would be, what would we do differently if we focused on the ways we are alike rather than on how we are different? Sorry, that's me too. Uh, a Place at the Table is another story that centers around food. This book by Sadia Faruqi and Laura Chauvin is told in two voices, each author taking the voice of one of the uh, children in the story. Uh, when her family can no longer afford to send her to her small Islamic academy where she knew everyone, Sarah is sent to the large public middle school. All she wants to do is fly under the radar and focus on her drawing. But when her mom takes a job as the new cooking club instructor in order to supplement the income from her catering business, Sarah can't hide any longer. Elizabeth and Sarah meet in cooking club when Elizabeth's longtime BFF Maddie ditches her for the cupcake queen. They discover a common goal of getting their English and Pakistani mothers to take their citizenship test tests. Changing alliances and racism lead to anger, missteps, and new understanding as things change for this group of middle schoolers and their families. And that's my question for you is, when we think of immigration and citizenship, do we only focus on the stories of those who we see as different? 
And does your family have an immigration story? Okay, for sixth through ninth graders, this is an autobiography by Rex Ogle. This is free lunch. Uh, topics, impoverished, hunger, and shame. Rex is ashamed being on the free lunch program at his new school and constantly takes care of his younger brother with absent grown-ups in his life. Free lunch is the story of Rex's efforts to navigate his first semester of sixth grade. Who to sit with, not being able to join the football team, Halloween in a handmade costume, classmates and a teacher who take one look at him and decide he's trouble, all while wearing secondhand clothes and being hungry. Here's a question to think about. When a child sees unfairness and bias from a grown up towards them, what are the proper resources for a student to speak up? This is paper, The Paper Kingdom by Helena Kuri and Pascal Champion. And this is an imaginative book about Daniel. Daniel is woken out of bed to join his parents as they head downtown for their jobs as nighttime office cleaners. But the story is more than brooms, mops, and vacuums. Many adults work nights and weekends and their children spend nights with alternate caregivers and sometimes their caregiving situation is a little unstable because their parents have to prioritize work um, sometimes too. And my question for you here is, are your curriculum events or social events approachable for parents who have an atypical work schedule? And I have a bonus question for you. Are your units about work inclusive of working mothers, stay-at-home dads, or and atypical schedules? Becoming Muhammad Ali is a fiction book and it's book one in what is a planned series uh, told by two authors, James Patterson and Kwame Alexander. It's good for third to seventh grade. Uh, this particular installment deals with identity, history, and boxing. It's a novel in two voices um, and it tells the charismatic story of Cassius Clay. Dynamic and determined, Clay's chapters are told in verse um, and written by Kwame Alexander as he struggles through academics at school and go to when he discovers boxing and starts down the road to his place in history. His best friend, Lucky, has alternate chapters written by James Patterson that are written in prose. And he gives us the friends and observers view of life during this time period, during the civil rights era, as well as the rising fortunes of the greatest. How can we tell our own stories is my question for you in the context of the historical moments we're living through or how can we help uh, the kids in our lives tell those stories of their lives in context to history? Yes, me too. Santiago's Road Home by Alexandra Diaz is a moving and sometimes difficult story. It's for fourth through seventh graders. Um, the difficult topics are not handled in too painful detail, but it deals with abuse, uh, journeying, and detention. Santiago, in the opening, feels that death is approaching and he's not afraid because he's hoping it will bring him peace. When Santiago's cruel aunt kicks him out, complaining of another mouth to feed when her husband has lost his job, the 12-year-old refuses to return to live with his abusive grandmother, who he calls La Malvada, or the evil one. He decides he's going to head to El Otro Lado, the United States, where it must be safer. Along the way, Santiago meets Maria Dolores and her daughter Alegria, and they travel together to start their new lives. But when they're separated at the border, Santiago fears that detention may mean the end of the road for him and all he's seeking is peace. So what are some ways that we seek to change our lives for the better? And what is the difference between immigration uh, and asylum? This is Look Both Ways, A Tale Told in 10 Blocks by Jason Reynolds, fiction for fifth through ninth graders. Topics are community, school life, and humor. 
Jason Reynolds conjures 10 tales, one per block, about what happens after the dismissal bell rings and brilliantly weaves them into one funny, important look at the many paths we might take on a simple walk home. Told with so much heart and humor, I smiled so much reading this. Home life and school life mingle together, and we just hope that it turns out for the best. Reynolds has an ability to effortlessly slip into different, often conflicting points of view. The characters are as compelling as they are numerous. Their stories distinct, each carrying their own flavor and texture. A question to consider, how do you present the importance of different viewpoints to showcase art or solve a problem? There's another place where art features. Chance, Escape from the Holocaust by Uri Shulevitz is his autobiography. Um, good for fifth through eighth grade, though, where it does cover some heavy topics. Uh, survival, exile, and art feature strongly in this book, which is getting a lot of Newberry buzz right now. I think it's at five or six starred reviews. Um, Arter and writer, writer, artist and writer, Uri Shulevitz is now in his 80s. His memoir begins in 1939 when he's about four years old and his Jewish family is fleeing Warsaw as Nazi forces advance. Through years of deprivation and hardship in the Soviet Union, Yuri and his family try to hold on. Chapters are short, short and often harrowing as Yuri recounts both the suffering, both his and other uh, refugees that they encounter along the way. Um, and also the ways he managed to carve out some semblance of boyhood, friendship, and play amidst the poverty. Some chapters do give a really unflinching look at not just suffering, but even death. Um, but through it all, family and art are the things that sustain Yuri so that he can survive and eventually find safety and fulfillment doing the something he loves. Uh, so do we give children enough opportunity to explore pursuits outside of the traditional academic ones? Art, music, theater, performance, writing, all have the powers to lift up and even sustain. So do we use them? The Mighty Heart of Sunny St. James by Ashley Herring Blake, fiction sixth through eighth graders. This features LGBTQ plus, romance and health issues. 12 year old Sunny St. James navigates heart surgery, reconnections with a lost mother, the betrayal of a former best friend and emerging feelings for another girl. Sunny's guardian is protective of not only Sunny's physical heart, but her emotional one as well, when Sunny's mother appears after being absent in her life for so long. My question to you is, how do you begin a dialogue concerning the best welfare for a child when grownups in this situation have different values? All right, I'm bringing you a little lighter touch now. Stand Up, Yumi Chung by author Jessica Kim is good for fourth, maybe even third through sixth grade, seventh grade. It deals with uh, Korean barbecue, haiguan, and comedy. Yumi Tr Chung is trying not to stand out, but her classmates tease her by calling her Yu Meat since she smells like her parents' Korean barbecue restaurant. When summer comes, she just wants to hang out at the library and to watch YouTube videos of her favorite stand-up comic. But summer school at the intensely academic Hagwon is overwhelming her. Escape comes in the form of a stolen identity and time on stage with her idol. Will Yumi realize her com comedic dreams and save the day for her family's struggling restaurant? Or will it all crash and burn when she's discovered? Where it, this is really a funny book. Where is the balance between family responsibility, parent expectation, and individual dreams and goals? Okay, Cat Lee brings us a brings a Snapdragon, a graphic novel, fifth through eighth graders with magic, LGBTQ plus, and connections. Snaps befriends a witch, Jax, who is just a crock swearing internet savvy old lady who sells roadkill skeletons online after doing a little ritual to put their spirits to rest. Intergenerational friendships are really strong and solid here, as well as interracial queer relationships. More of that, please. A question to consider. What are great teaching points when different generations come together to solve a challenge? 
Here we have Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga for fifth through eighth graders. And this is fiction dealing with emigration, language barrier, and family. Judah, with her mother, emigrates from Syria to America to live with her uncle and their family. And Judah keeps her identity and culture intact by staying true to herself. This beautiful novel told in verse is an immersive, emotional experience. And one of my favorite passages, there is an Arabic proverb that says, she makes you feel like a loaf of freshly baked bread. It is said about the nicest, kindest people, the type of people who help you rise. We all need to feel like a loaf of freshly baked bread. Yes, and we all need to help people to rise. Oh my gosh, love it. A question for discussion. How can you help immigrants overcome their fear of doing day-to-day -day activities when language is a challenge? Twins is another uh, graphic novel that is gonna be, I think, well-loved by your babysitter club, Raina Teldemeyer loving uh, roller girl fans. Um, and this one is Twins by Varian Johnson, who also wrote The Parker Inheritance, if you're familiar with that story, mm -hmm. um, and illustrated by Shannon Wright. It's about school, competition, and identity. It's a story at the start of sixth grade where Francine and Maureen are in separate classes for the first time. There, they begin to forge new identities not related to their twinness. The transition isn't smooth as secrets threaten to come between these close sisters. But strong, positive adult characters who don't always get it right, but always try, and supportive friends help the sisters through the transition to middle school um, and into their unique identities, even when they both set out to run for the same student council position. How do internal and external expectations affect the search for identity, and how and what can we provide to support the journey? For fifth through eighth graders, we have From the Desk of Zoe Washington by Janae Marks with incarceration, baking, and family as the topics. Zoe is an, is an aspiring baker with dreams of competing in her favorite kids cooking show competition on the Food Network. She's planning on spending her summer interning at a local bakery and hanging out with her friends. But everything changes when she receives a letter from Marcus, her biological father, who is in jail for murder. Marcus says he is innocent, but is he? Zoe begins a correspondence with him and learns more about herself, Marcus, the justice system, and the reality of the world we live in. The author navigates complex issues, systemic racism, the justice system, friendship, family, with much honesty. A question for you. How do you talk about the justice system with both its merits and faults to a young audience? For fifth through eighth graders, this is by two authors, Holly Goldberg Sloan and Meg Wallitzer. This is to Night Owl from Dogfish, dealing with LGBTQ plus blended family and reluctance. Avery Bloom, who's bookish, intense, and afraid of many things, particularly deep water, lives in New York City. Bet Devlin, who's fearless, outgoing, and loves all animals as well as the ocean, lives in California. What they have in common is that they are both 12 years old and are both being raised by single gay dads. When their dads fall in love, Bet and Avery are sent against their will to the same sleepaway camp. Their dads hope that they will find common ground and become friends and possibly one day even sisters. But things soon go off the rails for the girls and for their dads, and they find themselves on a summer adventure that neither of them could have predicted. This book is hilarious and it's told with a lot of heart. It's told specifically from emails from the girls with occasional letters from the dads too. A good talking point. What is the meaning of family today and does it differ from 10 years ago and 50 years ago? Okay, and here we have one in the princess category. This is a fiction series. Um, this one, Diary of an Ice Princess is the series and Snow Place Like Home is this uh, entry for first through third grade. Um, deals with magic, groundlings and friendship. Lena is the daughter of a mixed marriage between a magical mother and a groundling father. 
As she gets ready to come into her own powers that deal with controlling the weather, will she be able to keep her secret and keep her friendship with groundling Claudia? Um, and one of the things, this book is illustrated throughout, and one of the things that I wanted you to think about with your collections is how do the unspoken parts of the story, like the illustrations, help support uh, diversity in your collections, princess books and beyond. having trouble finding that unmute button. This is a picture book called Are Your Stars Like My Stars? And the whole concept of this book, and this is one of another one of my favorite books of the year, it's very cute, um, is that we all look at the same sky and we all um, have things that make our culture unique. And it's our perspective that brings us together. Tom, if you wanna move on to the next, here's the illustration that I want you to look at. The young narrator asks children around the world if they see the same type of color. So here we have the blue illustration, we have um, a beach, and then we have some children playing, you know, with um, soccer in a street. It reminds me of Greece and Italy. Um, and then when it's talking about colors, think of how gold is significant to um, Hindu cultures and how red is symbolic of the Lunar New Year, but green also means jungles. And my question for you here is, um, do your concept books have diverse representation? And if they don't, you need Are Your Stars Like My Stars? And also, Amy's last book about princesses made me think of this one. Um, do your high interest books and your high appeal books have diverse representation as well. Okay, this is a board book called Who is Making a Mess? And it is by Maria Dehane and Charlie Eve Ryan. And this is a call and response book. So the call is who is making a mess? And the response is grandpa or grandma or brother. And this is a perfect book about how everyone makes a mess. And it's not just children who make a mess, which is sometimes the um, stereotype presented in books these days that children are the only ones who make a mess when I know that's not true. <laughs> and this book is really great because it has diverse families and at, as you can see from the cover, and it also has diverse interests. And what I mean by that is there's an illustration, and I wish I had put it on this slide, where um, the grandpa is the one baking with the kids. And I love how it's the grandfather and not the grandmother who's doing something like baking. So it's diverse in terms of families, but also um, in interests. And I really appreciate that. And it's great for story time and reading aloud. My question for you is, do adults model cleaning up and taking care of their space or are we just putting that ownership on children these days? Thoughts to consider. Yep. And uh, speaking of messes, <laughs> whoo, yeah, okay, here we go. Bubonic Panic, When Plague Invaded America by Gail Jarrow. This is nonfiction sixth through eighth graders dealing with politics, plague and racism. The dedication and determination of scientists are seen as they battled the bubonic plague at the turn of the 20th century in San Francisco. Okay, now early on in this pandemic that we're in, we saw many people be distrustful of the Asian community. Well, this happened too in San Francisco more than a hundred years ago. Lots of politics affected the search for causes and cures back then. And this could be happening now as well. So a question for you, how do we prevent racism during a pandemic? If you're going to a march by Martha Freeman and Violet Kim, it is activism meets if you give a mouse a cookie. An example, if I um, am going to a march, what should I wear? How will I get there? Where will I be able to go to the bathroom? Is it okay to dance? Yeah, it's good to dance. And this addresses the many questions that children might have as they witness more marches happening 
or if they participate in a march with their caregivers. And this is a really great primer for safe, nonviolent protests. And it's an excellent book to reach for if your children are asking questions about protests. And it also very much reads like a social story. So if your kids are into books that are like social stories or if your children need social stories, and if you don't know what social stories are, we'll put something in there, our reference pages, which we'll send to you on Monday um, about social stories. But this is a great one um, for something like that. And as we have protests happening around us more frequently, um, do you give children space to talk about events that might be troubling them? Are you talking with them about events that they see on the news or that they're hearing adults talk about? Because they probably can tell that you're worried about some of those things and they probably also need space to talk about them. Okay, um, I realize on the princess book, I neglected to tell you the author, and it happens to be the same author as this book. So Christina Soon Tornvat is uh, a very uh, broad author. She writes princess books, and she has some, uh, some middle grade fantasy as well as some middle grade fiction, and she has this nonfiction entry. Good for fourth through eighth grade, Thailand survival and suspense. This is a gripping nonfiction book that recounts the 18 days that the Thai boys soccer team and their coach spent trapped in a flooding cave. As the world watched, an international effort was undertaken to pull off a miraculous rescue. Christina Soon Tornvat wanted to be the one to tell this story so that the focus stayed centered on Thailand, where she is from, and not on the outside rescuers. In short, suspense, in short suspenseful chapters, we get a sense of the landscape and the culture, as well as the incredible rescue effort. This book comes with maps and diagrams of the cave, as well as de details about the rescue effort. But the chapters are short, it's very accessible. I happened to pick this book up off the shelf, and then I think I stood in one place and read for 25 minutes. It just got sucked in so fast. So your kids who like nonfiction, survival, adventure, or like a lot of details, even the scientific details about how they were gonna get these kids out of the cave. And um, it is really a fascinating story, like Apollo 13. That's kind of what it made me think of how, even though I knew the outcome, I still was kind of on the edge of my seat reading. Um, so my question for you with this story would be, how do we present kids with multiple perspectives on stories in the, in the news? And do we present material in ways that allow for accurate cultural representation? This is uh, They Called Us Enemy by George Takei by Justin Isinger and Stephen Scott a graphic novel, sixth through eighth graders, dealing with internment, racism, and hope. In 1942, at the order of President Franklin Roosevelt, every person of Japanese descent on the West Coast was rounded up and shipped to one of 10 relocation centers, hundreds or thousands of miles from home, where they would be held for years under armed guard. They Call This Enemy is Takei's first-hand account of those years behind barbed wire, the joys and terrors of growing up under legalized racism, his mother's hard choices, his father's faith in democracy, and the way those experiences planted the seeds for his astonishing future. Here are two pages from there. Comics can often help initiate hard conversations by opening people's eyes to new experiences and forcing them to face those experiences head on, including the mistreatment of people of color, slavery, the Japanese internment, the civil rights movement, immigrant struggle at the border, police brutality, and much more. A question for you. What are other ways to help initiate challenging conversations through literature or other means? Very, very powerful book. Absolutely. I mean, we all recommend these books. This one, please pick it up. The next two felt important to put together on a slide. This is the ABCs of Black History by Rio Cortez and Black is a Rainbow Color by Angela Joy. And these two books 
um, are part of a trend that's coming out, which is long needed, that celebrate Black history and have a theme of people who identify as Black sharing Black history and celebrating Black history. And this fills in some of the gaps that maybe we should have been taught in school. I know that this was definitely missing from part of um, my school's curriculum. I like to think we're doing better now, but um, these are definitely great picture books to um, reach for when you are talking about history units and when you're developing your history units. Um, they're also concept books too. They read like concept books. Um, and they present it in a way that is very bold and beautiful and not dull. They're very engaging. So with that said, are your history units inclusive of diverse perspectives? Is your bookshelf inclusive of diverse perspectives, especially as we're talking about history? Um, consider how the LGBTQ plus community and how Black Indigenous people of color might be impacted by a narrow representation in history. This is me too. This is a graphic novel. I do read things that aren't picture books. This is a graphic novel for fifth to eighth graders and adults. If you're an adult, read this one too. This is when stars are scattered by, um, it's illustrated by Victoria Jameson and Omar Mohammed. And Victoria Jameson's name might be familiar to you because she wrote Roller Girl, which is another one of my favorite graphic novels, but she's also a really appealing um, colorist and illustrator. And so this is a great book to hand to your kids who just gobble up graphic novels, but you want to give them something a little bit different because this um, is really appealing for graphic novel readers. Her style is really appealing. And in this one, this is Omar's story. So it's a hashtag own voices story. Omar and his brother have spent most of their lives in a refugee camp in Kenya. Their lives change when Omar has a chance to go to school and realize his dreams. And this is one of those books that uh, made me realize that refugees are not always as transient as we think they might be. Some um, refugees spend a considerable amount of time in refugee camps and refugee camps are true communities. And they, while they have people coming and going, they also have people who stay there for a really long time. And my question for you is, how are refugees presented in your learning materials? Are they always sad? Are they always in turmoil? Or are they hopeful? Or are they, um, you know, looking forward to their future? Okay, so now this is a fiction story that I really want teachers to read. If you were going to hand this to kids, I would recommend this for um, your seventh graders or eighth graders, maybe even some high schoolers. It's very um, heavy. And this is a story about two sisters, sexual abuse and finding your voice despite traumatic life experiences. And this is also written by the author of The War That Saved My Life. And it's totally completely different. So I would caution you not to hand this to children just because they have liked the author's previous books. It's totally different and significantly more mature in its content. And this is a reminder that adults don't always know what kids are experiencing in their lives and at home. And the teacher in this book has very high expectations for the main character when the main character is really just trying to get through to the next day. And she's worried about her sister and she's trying to get used to her foster mother. And the other thing that I really like about this book is that the foster mother in this story is has a positive impact on these sisters and she doesn't have, she doesn't carry the same stereotypes that many foster parents carry in when we are, read about them in stories. And so my question is, how are foster homes represented in your bookshelves? How are diverse home situations represented? Another one for teachers, you've probably heard me talk about this before. It's one of my favorites. It is a graphic novel for teachers and eighth graders or anybody who is about to experience their cycle for the first time. And it's written by Lily Williams and Karen Schneeman. And this is a story about girls 
and friendship. And these girls are sick of an administration that puts football before female health. And these girls, kind of spurred by their anger, confront a world that shrugs or worse, squirms at the thought of a menstruation revolution. They band together to make change. And positive female friendships, diverse representation of what it means to have your period and how some people have a period that's very normal and not painful. And then some women have a period that's terrible and they just want to lay in a ball in bed and that's all they want to do all day. Um, it encompasses all of those things. And there are some LGBTQ themes in this book as well and some diverse family um, representation in here as well as one of the main characters lives with her grandmother. And it's sassy, it's got a great sense of humor, and it the only color used in this book is red. So it's fitting here. And my question for you is, what are we teaching young males about female menstruation to help get rid of that squirming that they experience when women talk about menstruating? And how can we remove that stigma in education and in this, the, our books and in our book uh, collections and things like that? Okay, so Amy. Okay, so um, one of the thing, other things we wanted to just um, make you aware of is some of the other resources that we have in the library. And currently we've just uh, curated a set of kits and under kind of a let's talk theme in our first uh, topic is race. So there are six different kits and they range from a pack of board books with very simple um, talking points and noticing points that you would guide you through just a conversation with your toddlers up to some sets with picture books. You can see uh, black is a rainbow color kind of on the <laughs> cover of one of those. Um, so we have two sets with multiple picture books in them. And then two with heavy topic picture books um, on gun violence and on racism in general. And then the, the final one is uh, multiple copies of the book Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram Kendi, Kendi intended for uh, older group book discussion. I think there are six copies in there. So those are available in the library for you to check out. They come with a little binder with some suggested questions. Um, to guide your conversations and as well as a few resources as, and a comment card, which we would love to have you fill out if you check one out and let us know what other topics you might like us to, to tackle or just how you felt about the kit. With our Let's Talk Race kits, we also have this wall that's very wonderful and um, diverse. And the black backpacks are our more traditional play packs and they are a curated collection of toys. And these toys are also designed to um, kind of get you thinking about inclusivity in toys and how children play with toys and how toys can be a way that they learn about the world around them, right? And we also have switch adapted toys. So if you um, have a child who it has a disability and has trouble manipulating traditional toys, they have some that are switch activated and they light up and they vibrate and they're really cool. And those can also be great learning tools for other um, children as well who may not realize that some kids can't physically play with traditional toys. And then on the right, um, those stacks of books are called stack packs, and these are um, great co uh, curated collections of five or six books for you to come in and grab and take home without having to think about it. They're your one-stop shop if you are in a hurry or if you just want somebody to pick out books for you. And I forgot to talk about our American Girl dolls. We have a very popular collection of American Girl dolls that are also inclusive. We have Black American girls, we have Hispanic American girls, we have girls to go to, go to space, and we also have um, an American boy. So if you're looking to model inclusivity with dolls, definitely check out the American Girl dolls too. Okay, so before we um, get into this question, can we drop the survey into the chat, I'm looking at our time here. And as you're waiting for that survey to come, 
tell us about some of the things that you were excited about our presentation. What's one book that you want to take home and, and read and share with your children? What excites you about the things that we were talking about? And if you want to also change your, um, your chat to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see it. Tom, can you send that to all? Thank you. <laughs> and you're muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Yes, I sent it just to us three. Like, nope, that I need to send it. <laughs> I'm not taking it. <laughs> I said I need to send. I just sent it to all of you. Yeah. So before, yeah, it, just go ahead and click on that. It'll open up in a new browser. Just keep. I mean, new. Well, just a new tab. Keep that open. But that way, it's there, even when we uh, end this meeting. Yeah. And, and we that's did have a couple. That go ahead. You go. I was just going to say we uh, did have a couple of questions about resources. We will send you the book list and an additional some additional resources um, next week. And that is the survey that you have to fill out in order to get your CPDU credit if you're interested in one of those. And if you liked this style of program, definitely check out the recordings of our BYOB programs on YouTube and Facebook and Library Market. And we also have a BYOB Junior if you are looking for titles like these that are for children. So we have an adult version if you're looking for those good adult books and some um, for kids as well. Or if you just like to hear Amy talk about books, check out those BYOB Junior ones. <laughs> Are your stars like my stars? I love that oh, one. Oh, another one. Thank you, Lisa. Megan, they look amazing. I know there's so many books. Yes, these are great. Yeah, we Th had a thank hard you, time. We had, oh my gosh, yeah, this is. 45 is not enough. Yeah, you <laughs> would think like. could have made this a whole series. So also yeah. let us know if you're interested in another yeah. program. But like what's this. great is the thing is there's so many books coming out constantly, consistently, which is amazing. Let's keep these kinds of books on our shelves. Let's talk about them. All yeah. the, yeah. Great. I can't wait. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Great. Oh my gosh, we're oh, I'm so glad excited. to hear yeah. that. Uh, Kim's yeah. gonna put some on her match March Madness. We are water protectors. Is I, so, I wouldn't be that one our mock Caldecott Caldecott. Award. <laughs> Cald <laughs> Jinx. Uh, and oh, um, go with the flow. I've been hearing talking talked about as a Newberry. So yeah, yep. And if you know, that's <laughs> also I didn't. Thank you, Jennifer. This, but if you have girls in your life where just experiencing that for the first time, hand them this book, they're gonna need it. Ellen says, my 10 year old totally creeped in to listen and he put his iPad down. That's like, <laughs> that's the best, that's the best. That's <laughs> amazing. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, must read, must read. tried to get yeah. those. Mm -hmm. I it's, also really love Tom's bread description. That's how I'm gonna try and live my life from here be, on. Be bread and help, oh. and help people to rise. But I yes, do. Amanda- Let's make t-shirts, let's make t-shirts. Yeah. Trying to be bread. It's important that, <laughs> yes, as grownups, we're reading, the, reading these in order to share these with younger kids because I can, I can probably honestly say when we were younger, we did not have this many diverse books. We, we just didn't. And it's never too late to get more and to talk about diversity. It's never yeah. too late. And my, our marketing Thank coordinator you, specialist oh. is, sorry, Rachel, is in the audience with us right now. And she wants me to let you know that there will be another survey coming out too. Um, so if you see another one, know that it's a totally different survey, survey. And if you are not interested in CPDU credits, that's the survey for you to fill out. Um, and she'll post the recording of this program in a few days, so you'll be able to watch the recording again. Yeah, and I think um, we have the uh, recording of the chat, right? So if there are any questions we don't get to or things we want to follow up, we'll include that information in the resources that we send out. Yep, I think so, yes. Aaron, I'm looking at your question. Yeah, I will, I will follow up with you on that with short stories on LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you have, that reminds me, if you have specific diverse um, identities that you're looking to represent in your classrooms and you want recommendations in, with your um, kids, look for the Your Next Read form. Um, 
on our website because that is handpicked recommendations for whatever your needs are, right. adults and kids alike. Oh. And we can also work with this if you're making um, with one of the schools and you use the classroom collection form, you can always use that vehicle too to request books on particular topics and we're happy to research those for you and get what you need. Your name is a song is also beautiful and it and it gets some of those very Americanized names in there also, so. Yeah, Mari, okay, Mari, I got you. Yes, and I just, I just, put, in the, I just put in the chat just a link to uh, your next read. So the thing is, you're always more than welcome just to give us a call. Hi, I would like a book recommendation, but you can also just use this form. Uh, it just takes, it, it just takes a, a, f a minute to fill out. Um, you can fill it out, have, fill it out with your kid, and we will give you uh, five recommendations within 24 hours. And you have the choice to either, we give the recommendations to you, you put them on hold, or we put them on hold for you. We are here to help you. If you don't know what book to read, please ask we'll us. It is, we will tell you, <laughs> here's the books to read. Yep. And if you have filled out that survey, you are free to go. Um, that was the conclusion of our program. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. We'll hang out here if you have any questions yep. for us. We'll hang out. Um, but once you've filled out that survey, oh, you're welcome, Aaron. Feel free to yep. hit the road. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're welcome, you. Tammy. Yes, you're welcome, Tammy. Yes, Ellen. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks oh my gosh. Yay. We. I can't tell you. We had so much. How do you go to the it's... survey? Can you drop it back in there? I'll drop. Yeah. So it's pre at the top of the list. I'll do, I'll jab. I'll, I'll I'm putting uh, my email in here as well. And if you still can't access that, hold on. Where's that? So you get a hold of me. Where's that survey again? Hold on. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah. I just put in. Okay. I just put in the chat again. Just uh, the, the link to the to the survey. So I know. Click it, on that. It yeah, got. So, it got. We're uh, seeing awesome yeah. comments, but I think yes. Yeah, sometimes it just yeah. got. It just so got Amanda, lost. you just click on it, and then you, mm -hmm. it'll take you to outside to Perfect. another form. Right. I think she's got it. And it's You're the so same cool. form you would get in an in-person one. It's just yep. electronic. Because it just helps us <laughs> help us help you. That's essentially. I mean, surveys. That's that's what they're there for. Help us help you. Dion, I see your comment about Kenya. Yep, definitely let us know if you also want more books that are set in Kenya. Mm -hmm. or, and refugee camps. And... Mm -hmm, absolutely. All 13 and I talk like everybody. Yes, your name is a song is also for you, Vian. It's for you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Lisa. Thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks so much for coming. We it, again, we yeah we enjoyed we enjoyed this immensely because this is this is things are happening. This is I mean yes things are happening, but this is so great that diversity is being talked now more so than ever, and it just needs to continue from here on out. And yes, that's the right title. Your name is a song. Is the one that you want. Yeah. Was, I was gonna say, All right, so I'm going to give it to author. eight. Oh, the refugee title was when stars, stars are scattered. Are scattered, and I can email that to you also. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we'll email the the complete list of uh, of all the titles we said. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll get that on Monday. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to give it till 8.15 here, and then we'll sure. close yep. our webinar. Mm -hmm. yep. But any questions? Yeah, please. Go, we go have ahead. To, do we have You're to be welcome. open in a webinar for them to return the survey? No. No. Mm -mm. Okay. It, it just, just goes through to, email. Yeah. You are very welcome. You're so welcome. I just welcome. want to make sure there aren't any questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep.
Thank you. Thank you. When, when will we be doing it again? Probably. <laughs> we'll just, yeah. Maybe summer. It's, yeah, I was going to say it's been yearly, but uh, maybe we need to do it sooner. Mm -hmm. If you want us to narrow down on a more specific topic or Good night, Yvonne. Thank you for or coming. whatever, let us know. Thanks, Julie. But yeah, we should yeah, we should do this. We should do this over the over the summer.